Hello, traders. It's Friday, June the 10th. This is John Kicklider, Chief Strategist for DailyFX.com, here to give your FX market wrap-up for the past 24 hours of trade, as well as an for what we can expect in the final 24 hours ahead of us. Well, the risk charge finally seemed to lose some of its traction. The S&P 500 ended the day on a down note. This is the first decline that it has seen in the past four trading days. I wouldn't call this a reversal, certainly, but at the same time, it is definitely good evidence that there is a lack of conviction fueling this move. It is tough to generate sentiment near record highs when the fundamental backdrop looks as uh, uneven as it does. This is growth. This is a lack of uh, yield or revenue or return. Uh, this is financial instability. All right. There are a number of issues that are very prominent and frequently reminded to us as individual investors as or as broad institutions that are looking to extract value from the market. So looking for value is not something that is particularly easy to do when you have uh, investments that are at these kind of levels. So it's not surprising at all that we are struggling for uh, upside move, as I've said before, my uh, expectations in terms of scenarios. There is absolutely the opportunity for it to continue to rise. The issue is that conviction would always be very thin behind that kind of scenario, uh, uh, with the exception of perhaps a sudden return of uh, global growth. And if that's the case, then you're talking about a choppy continuation, right? not a particularly appealing investment opportunity, perhaps some tactical uh, uh, opportunity, but it's going to have to be in something that isn't as uh, a focal point and at these heights uh, as the S&P 500. Alternatively, a reversal, a meaningful reversal towards risk conversion may not be the highest probability given the circumstances, but the potential that it carries. Uh, the impact that it would have if it were to occur would be far more profound. It would be more readily accessible in terms of momentum because the backing of the market is thin, uh, volume is very thin, and as we've seen many times before, volatility is particularly primed to being shaken up. All right, And as it happens, I believe I have the chart uh, somewhere here, Volume and volatility are inextricably linked. Somewhere around here. Nope, that's not. Volume and volatility, when you're talking about uh, active markets, all right, and things start to become unstable. All right. Things start to pick up, things start to become erratic, and remember, as we've been talking about over the past two uh, days' strategy videos, volatility is a reflection on markets that simply uh, are uh, difficult to read. All right. We don't know if it's going to go up or down, but we do know that there is a high probability of fast-moving markets. So that uh, that is uncertainty and explosiveness in a combination. You can imagine those types of circumstances incur heavy trading as people try to uh, adapt to it more so to get away from the risk that it entails. And the volume starts to pick up. So volatility is certainly uh, something that ushers in heavy volume, and that's why you uh, tend to have faster risk aversion type moves, especially when we're talking about a uh, risk-oriented asset, when there's a directional uh, view to sentiment in the asset that we're looking at. And the S&P 500 is perhaps one of the best uh, examples of just that. All right. Now, while we sit here and watch to see this struggle and see if it continues to struggle higher or if it starts to pull back, I do want to note that the ATR, the average true range, a more statistical measure of uh, volatility, in and just generally activity measure is the lowest that we have seen since back here right, back here in june of 2015 that's 12 months ago but 12 months ago is where we actually finally saw that this very consistent bull trend was actually finally starting to fall apart now we didn't really get the major downward shocks until august of uh, this past year but nevertheless that is a com comparison we're making to the complacency where people were uh, cautiously and uh, nervously quiet 
Right? They recognized that something was amiss. These are the types of comparable conditions that we're looking at. That's not to say that we're going to have an immediate decline. Even back then, back in June, uh, it took some time before we actually got to a very meaningful move. But it certainly does paint the picture for the kind of trade trading that we should do. Cautious, more short-term oriented, and keeping a very vigilant eye for a rise in volatility. So the rise in volatility is obviously the reason why I maintain my risk-oriented uh, dollar-yen, risk aversion particularly. Uh, the break of the 116 was a big head and shoulders pattern, and this was my first foray into risk aversion on a more systemic basis. But the S&P 500 continues to push record highs and is dragging other uh, equity markets with it and other risk-oriented assets with it. So it's definitely not a full-fledged theme that I, I really would want to build a trade into. And remember, it's not just building into dollar-yen. That's not my aim. My aim is to build into risk aversion when it shows itself, which is why I have two other yen-oriented crosses that I'm, uh, I certainly think have great potential should the theme arise. Euro-yen, uh, now at this point the support continues to drop, but I'm not going to call it as a trade and add to my exposure until I actually see the sentiment change. Right? Otherwise, it is uh, increasingly a gamble, an expensive gamble, because my exposure is greater. As well as the Kiwi Yen, which I think uh, could be substituted, I guess, for an Aussie Yen or a CAD Yen, but the, uh, the Kiwi Yen is certainly one of the more uh, prominent carry trades. It's really, its purpose is amongst the majors and amongst the more liquid currency pairs is for carry purposes, particularly the New Zealand dollar. So, if I do get full-scale risk aversion, Euro Yen and Kiwi Yen are where I'm going to add. I'm not just going to add into Dollar Yen. I actually am unlikely to add to my Dollar Yen short. Uh, but I need to see risk aversion. And as yet, it hasn't shown itself. It's still hesitation and certainly a lot of skepticism, but the markets aren't running with that skepticism just yet. Now, going back to the Kiwi Yen, the Kiwi Dollar itself was... Uh, obviously one of this past session's most impressive movers and that was motivated obviously from the RBNZ rate decision which we covered yesterday. The RBNZ decided not to move rates uh, and that caught off guard enough traders, uh, the 24% that expected a rate cut, uh, and the subsequent testimony uh, from Governor Wheeler and the, the statement that he made uh, suggested that they were backing off of an imminent rate cut. Now in terms of where that actually puts the RBNZ, it, it modestly moves it down the curve, but it's still in competition with the RBA. RBA is argu uh, arguably in a little bit more of a neutral position than even the RBNZ, and subsequently, it really doesn't give a whole lot of buoyancy to the New Zealand dollar. When you look at the Kiwi dollar in those terms, I was watching a number of Kiwis based crosses. The Euro Kiwi was the really big break. It, it managed to hold most of its declines, but it really didn't find much, much fall through if, beyond the initial flush of volatility that we got with the RBNZ response. The same is true, however, also of the Kiwi USD, where my skepticism uh, was translated into a possible uh, fade. However, as I said yesterday, I'm going to watch this very closely, and if it starts to show reversal and the markets fade, then I definitely like it as an active trade. It never faded in a meaningful way. Sure, it backed off of the intraday highs from uh, Wednesday, or sorry, Thursday, but it really hasn't shown that it's turning. Now, the skepticism in the RBNZ's implications and the rebound that it gets from just losing some of its depreciated value on a rate cut basis, but it needs an active driver, all right? whether that be speculative in nature or that be, let's say, risk aversion. And yes, risk aversion will carry the Kiwi USD down as well. It needs to have some kind of motivator, it seems. And I'm only looking at this as a tactical trade, so I don't need a massive theme like the Fed rate expectations really picking up before I trade the QUS dollar to the short side. But I do need something, as the market seems to need something, something of substance. So keep an eye on this. 
But as we close in towards the close of the week and we drain liquidity for the weekend, this is a tactical trade, and I'm not looking to you know, place it to, you know, a couple hours before the close of the actual week uh, and just carry it over into the uh, next week because weekend uh, risk is in getting increasingly higher given the circumstances of both the markets becoming increasingly quiet under the presumption, I guess, of uh, summer trading or just the fear of what uh, the lack of volatility represents. But it's so easy in these market conditions to revive volatility with the drop of a hat. All right? And that means very risky markets. So the tactical view that this represents means that it's not something I'm just going to carry into the weekend. I'm just not going to follow a technical line and just close my eyes to market conditions and or fundamentals. Other Kiwi crosses, uh, the Aussie Kiwi actually did push uh, below 105. The Kiwi CAD uh, marked a little bit of follow through, uh, but none of these actually speak with the same kind of sentiment of follow through. Now, Aussie Kiwi did push lower, but this wasn't uh, the backing of the New Zealand dollar. It actually was a, a bit of weakness for the Australian dollar. I still have my Aussie USD long, and I've trailed the stop actually up to uh, break even plus 125 pips. That actually puts it right at here at uh, 0.74. So my trailed stop is actually quite close to where we are now. We'll see if this survives uh, through the end of the week. Uh, but... I'm happy to have it stopped out. I'm also happy to take advantage of any further momentum that it wants to put in. My whole intention for this was to be a short-term trade, and I will let that short-term trade play out as the market will let it. I'm not trying to project a multi-week trade with this particular currency pair. All right, that's not my, my approach. I'm definitely keeping it close to the tactical uh, when it comes to the Aussie yen, or Aussie dollar, sorry. Now, in terms of the scheduled event risk outside of the RBNZ and the potential that it generated in terms of some of the Kiwi dollar and other Kiwi crosses, uh, we did have uh, a range of event risks this past 24 hours that was quite interesting. Uh, perhaps for the macro people like myself, the bank create rate decision was actually very interesting uh, because of the surprise rate cut to record low. Uh, but it's more interesting because this is a reflection of a more dominant central bank's policies and the spillover effect it has, the BOG in particular. They also noted China, uh, Fed, and a number of other global conditions, but their big contention remains that the Bank of Japan is pursuing very aggressive monetary policy programs, and that means that they have to essentially adopt the same if they plan to keep up. A, a cr incredible accommodative policy producer himself, ECB President Draghi, was on the wires talking about his policy. Uh, and essentially it was more a call for uh, political efforts, uh, government to step up and take some of the slack because they are inherently reaching their limits the ECB, the BOJ, and other extremely accommodated monetary policies, they are not uh, rendering the same kind of impact that they have in the past. And that's the market recognizing that they have limited influence. And in turn, the central banks, either they have to take more dramatic steps, which makes uh, for greater instability, or they have to get the government uh, to balance out the load. The third option is that growth suddenly recovers. Right, but uh, it would be very uh, irresponsible to presume that just the economy is going to recover all by itself on, uh, as magic. So some interesting stuff over this past 24 hours. Monetary policy is still a big uh, theme here. In the final 24 hours of the trading week, we have a couple things that I think are worthy of our attention. Emerging markets with the uh, Russian Central Bank rate decision. We want to see how they're doing. This is one of the largest economies in the world. And its GDP matters, just like Brazil. Brazil is, a, is an enormous concern. Uh, but it doesn't have day-to-day -day volatility impact. But remember, we need to look at the bigger picture beyond just the day-to-day. -day. It's very important. In terms of scheduled event risk with heft in, ter in the short term, I would say watch the UK inflation forecast. This is the Bank of England's 12-month in inflation forecast. It tells us whether they can consider monetary policy at all. But realistically, most people are concerned with Brexit. It just so happens that Fitch is going to weigh in with a sovereign debt rating uh, for the UK, and they will essentially give us their assessment of what they expect. 
the most recent poll that we have, or I've seen uh, on the Brexit polls, show that the Remain crowd is ahead by one uh, percentage point. That was the independence, 45 to 44. Uh, the election ETC uh, poll was 51 to 49. So slightly in favor of Remain. All right, but we'll see what this has to say as well. The U.S. dollar is going to be watching the U.S. Consumer Sentiment Survey uh, with expectations and, very importantly here, inflation expectations. All of this is going to be in context of what this uh, pretty much final major piece of interest before the FOMC rate decision on the coming Wednesday uh, actually has to offer. This is the last chance uh, from a meaningful data perspective to change interest rate expectations before the Fed just descends upon the market. And yes, it will still have an influence even if they don't move rates. We'll look into this more in depth tomorrow. Uh, but this is not just a rate decision and not just a monetary policy statement. You have to remember, we have updated forecasts and Janet Yellen speaking. So it's not going to be just a focus on June and whether they did or did not do anything, but w uh, rather what the next move is going to be. And whether July, uh, actually... July figures are here. Whether July is a reasonable time frame or not for a rate hike. There's still considerable speculation, but the markets don't know how far they want to set that forecast. All right, so very important piece of event risk next week, and this is our last stop to get a good assessment of data before that. We already seen that Janet Yellen at the start of this week was the last opportunity from a, a policy speech perspective to alter those courses. All right, so some last opportunities for volatility for these majors, uh, and certainly pairs like the pound crosses are going to be looking at the, the existential concerns, the big fundamental themes like Brexit. Uh, the yen crosses are always going to be on the uh, edge looking at risk trends. So a lot of this is still potential energy, not kinetic energy. Uh, don't be looking for big trends because uh, they're going to be uh, not particularly common. Instead, remain more risk-oriented, meaning protect yourself, uh, and look for shorter-term opportunities as they arise, emphasizing more the technical, but certainly very mindful of the uh, event risk, both the scheduled and unscheduled, and what it can do for volatility. All right. We'll wrap it up there. We'll do our final rundown of these markets uh, and a more intense outlook for what to expect next week in tomorrow's video. Until then, I wish you good luck trading out there.